What's up, you guys? How are you guys doing? Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Oh, I need to get some caffeine in me. Angel, what's going on, bud? How you doing today? <coughs> uh, feeling better. Um, just had a sinus infection and, you know, it kind of set you back. The doctor gave me some steroids for it, so... Whew, sorry, don't mean to be yawning. Um, yeah, the doctor gave me some meds for it, so it's getting better. Like, I feel like I can talk now forever. My head doesn't feel like a, an exploding hot air balloon, so, I mean, that's great. <laughs> Much better. Better enough to be, like, teaching class. What's up, Logan? How did you guys do? Have you guys started? Um, first of all, let me. Melissa just posted a really cool looking animation for her hierarchies project um, inside of here inside of discord it looks really cool she did the whole factory thing um i've been seeing some really cool project annie this robot arm animation is really cool i love the the material and the textures and putting all of the dots and stuff on it i'm happy that you guys are uh having a little bit more fun with this kind of stuff so uh but yeah kudos to you guys doing really cool stuff uh, Mel, howdy partners, doing good. Hello, Jose, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, not much, I'm glad I'm feeling better. Thank you. Um, did you guys have any questions? The first thing I'm going to talk about, I guess, is the hierarchies and after effects because, because I was gone all last week, I want you guys to have the opportunity, um, who joined the live stream to ask any questions that you might have about, rigging inside of After Effects and if you have any questions about the illustrating process or rigging process or the animation process uh let me know here in the comments and we can discuss those and I can maybe go over those real quick and then if not we're going to be going over um rigging modeling and rigging inside of Cinema 4D today so we're going to create like an Eve bot um, and have, we're going to, I'm going to show you a different way to animate inside of Cinema 4D. Might get to that a little bit later, like, uh, Thursday. Not sure how far we'll get with the modeling, but, but yeah, let me get that kind of set up. And then let me know if you guys have those questions in the comments right now, and we'll, we'll address that first. Uh, let's see here. Make sure that this date is good. Let's publish this. All right, let me bring this over here for you guys. Any questions about hierarchies or using the rigging system inside of After Effects using anchor points and um, Pick Whip, the Pick Whip tool to essentially parent, right, your layers to each other to create the hierarchy to create either this robot arm animation or something similar to... Um, what I created last semester in class where I did like an entire assembly line. Uh, Mel, that assembly line, is that yours inside of, inside of Discord? Really neat. A lot of detail in it, which makes it look really cool.
Angel, cool. Angel, let's look at yours inside of Discord. Ooh, nice. Good color palette you got here going, Angel. Let me bring this over. Yeah, check that out. That looks great. Cool, good job, Angel. A little bit of work. You could probably update. Um, There's a couple things I would do. I'd maybe make this... I actually don't mind that he goes down a little bit slower to add the, to do the throw. Let's see. Just adding the motion blur, the, the motion blur to the ball as well. So I would just add that motion blur onto the ball layer. Um, make sure you're adding it onto both layers just to have consistency through the video. And then um, re-render that out. But I love the color palette that you picked here. It looks really nice. Looks cool. I could, you could even probably make the blues either on the background a little bit lighter or on the arm overall a little bit darker uh, because it's a little bit hard to see the difference between the background and the blue on the arm. Um, I would probably, to make it faster, just change the background. The, the gradient that you have here, just make the blue on this one a lighter blue. And I think you'll be good to go. I think that's really cool. But really cool, Angel. I'm happy that you posted this too. It looks great. Very neon retro cyberpunk colors. I'm into it. Yeah, <clears throat> Mel, the, yeah, the colors on this, the detail, make it um, just a lot more, you know, like when there's a lot of detail in a... In like anything, whether you're looking at an art piece or you're looking at a video or something like that, <clears throat> being able, first of all, to edit out all of the detail that might not be relevant to what you're looking at and learning to edit things down is a great thing. But when you have a lot of little animations within the overall animation, those little things... Um, they're just, you know, they make you feel good, right? You like sit there and it makes you rewatch it over and over because you start catching all these little detailed animations that you see within a video. And this is going to come into play a lot when we start um, next week's lesson doing like infographic stuff and working with um, adding like creating multiple scenes and putting them together. And so that's why I kind of prepped you guys and and buffed this project up last semester by doing like more of an assembly line so that you have more practice creating an entire composition and not necessarily just one object being animated through the video. I'm not saying that doing this one is bad. I like that you guys have done this one as well because you're focusing on the hierarchy of the arm. If you had more time, great to do this one. Um, but the, the little details that you do in the assembly line animation, like during that lesson, it just, um, it helps moving forward into the next lessons. But these look really cool. I'm proud of you guys and the work that you're producing in class. Neat. Okay, I'm going to move this over here so we're not busy. Looks like we don't have any questions about hierarchies. So um, if you do have any more questions about this, um, you know, you can ask me in Discord. You can send me a direct message if you want to or you have a question. Also, Bell will be available. But again, you guys will want to have this done. Uh, it's open until next Monday. So Make sure you guys are getting these in and for next Monday when the deadline closes, right? So make sure that if you're going to follow the tutorial, you can do the robot arm, um, which is right here. You can do the version one or version two, or you can do the assembly line animation. So dealer's choice here, right? But moving forward, today we're going to essentially kind of build on last week's lesson but this week is going to be based in um, Cinema 4D. And so what we're going to be creating is like an Eve robot here. Um, the video's playing really slow. I'm not qu quite sure why. It's almost like it's buffering. This should be playing really smoothly like this. Perfect. Yeah, just making sure that it's playing nice and smooth inside of the stream which it looks like it is. So um, we're going to be focusing on the hierarchies inside of Cinema 4D. Um, we're going to be using 
the parenting style inside of Cinema 40. It's a little bit different. The tools aren't necessarily called the same thing. You mostly, um, it's mostly about layer order inside of your object panel, which creates the hierarchy for you versus like having to connect the layers with a pick whip tool. You don't have that inside of Cinema 4D. Um, but we're going to start by learning to do a little bit of modeling. I know that I taught you guys how to use primitives and essentially cr make those primitives editable to create like a room like object, a very simple um, table we did and a room, but we're gonna do a little bit more based on that. Um, we're gonna touch back onto the basics of, of creating an editable object inside of Cinema 4D from a primitive. And um, we're going to model and build out Eve, and then we're going to rig her. And then we're going to animate Eve, uh, the Eve bot, and we're actually going to use motion capture, like kind of a version of motion capture, right? When you guys think of motion capture, I know you think of like the green suits with the little ping pong balls to it and stuff, and that's that's true. I mean, it's it's clearly evolved from the time when motion capture looked like that. Um, and now what they do is they have many cameras around in a space and they put dots around on their subject, whether that's an actor or it could be a dog or a cat. I know they used a cat. They used motion capture for a cat on the video game Stray. If you guys played that, um, that game was so much fun. It was very cute. But <clears throat> motion capture... Uh, they have like a tool inside of Cinema 40 where you can essentially use kind of like the idea of motion capture. So you'll grab your object and you'll move it around with your mouse. And however you move it around, it'll capture that motion the way that you do it. And it creates keyframes with that. And it's a great way of kind of blocking out animations. Uh, maybe a little bit more complex animations that you might have with an object. But we're going to talk more about that whole process probably on Thursday's class. Right now we're going to really focus on um, the modeling and rigging of the Eve bot. Now, we all know Eve from Wally, -E, right? Um, and we'll... So th that's what we're basing this model off of. She's not going to be perfectly looking like Eve, but um, we're going to do our best to make something very similar to her, right? So we that's what we did here. Oh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, we're going to be, yeah, discussing how to save a project incrementally inside of... Cinema 4D. And you can also do this inside of After Effects. But um, saving incrementally just means that as we go along in the process, you're going to essentially create a new file. It, you're, well, you're just going to save your file as like a numbered increment so that you can always move back in the process to a certain point when you were creating something within your project or a project yourself and um, go back to any kind of point in time where you had it in the original state or wherever you first saved it. And what those increments allow you to do is to go back and if you mess up, let's say you're on increment five and you do something and it messes it all up and you're like, man, I need to go back to when I had basic modeling of the object you can do that by going back to a previous save and so um, incremental saving is something that will help you just within your career in general it's it's just good habits to start to develop so that when because you will run into issues where you have corrupt files, damaged files, issues with files opening and stuff. And if you incrementally save, you're going to lose less work than you would if you didn't, right? If you had incrementally saved, let's say you do a, two days worth of work and you save an incremental file and then you do more work two more days and that file corrupts, you can go back two days versus like you never incrementally save and that file corrupts and you have to restart the entire project over. You can lose hours upon hours of work, which um, it's happened to people and they learn the hard way. So it's just a good thing to start to put in your um, 
habits while you're starting animation and working within any kind of any kind of digital program or software. Uh, let's see here. So if you guys want to watch the step-by-step -step process, um, I have them obviously all linked again, modeling, rigging, animating, and an alternative strategy to create the face on the Eve bot. There's a little bit of an issue when you just put the image onto Eve's face as like an, a, PNG file, like basically taking an object and pasting an image onto it. So if your guys are having trouble with that, there's an alternate way to do that right here. The deliverable for this project, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, one second. <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, a single MP4 of your eBot, she's going to be flying into the scene. She's going to be looking around. She's going to see something and then she's that thing is going to move and her head's going to follow it and she's going to fly off screen. Kind of like this. What you see happening is she's going to fly in screen, looking around, she sees an object and she follows that object off screen. Um, the format of this should be 1920 by 1080, as always, 24 frames a second. Um, making sure that you set the frame rate in three different places, right? So you want to set it in your Cinema 4D project in your render settings, your Cinema 4D render settings, and then also inside of After Effects, when you import the image sequence, right-clicking the image and interpreting the footage to 24 frames, right? So just remember that. And these are the things that I am looking for. This is the rubric. So when I'm grading, you will know how I'm grading it. All right, so let me move this over here. And let's go ahead and set up the project file. First of all, I've got it moved over here. I just need to move it back over here. All right. We're going to duplicate this, ready? Control C, Control V. Let's oh, go back. Go back and rename this to six underscore um, Eve bot. That's how I'm going to name this one. All right. So I've got my, so easy, right? When you have that temp, are you guys using the template folder? Let me know in the chat if you're using this, this template folder to create your projects. Um, and how you like it because it makes it so fast, right? Like I just literally had to copy paste and change the name and it's all ready to go. <laughs> Here. Um, let me minimize this and we are going to bring up Cinema 4D, which I have open on this side. Bring that over here. Hello. Do you guys have any questions before I get started into the modeling and stuff of the epoch? We might be able to go, so, I mean, in the past we've done Eve. I'm okay if you guys use a little bit more um, creativity when creating Eve. I know last semester we had someone add cat ears to Eve and, and stuff like that. Um, I want the concept of, I want the, the motions to be the same of Eve or your robot, right? So if my robot's flying into the scene, looking around, sees something, you know, she's, well, she flies into the scene, hovering, looking around, sees something, and then flies off the screen into that direction, your robot should do the same, right? Your robot can look a little different. You can have a little bit more fun modeling your robot. Um, don't get too crazy with materials because materials really affect rendering. Remember, I'm sure you guys have all run into that issue right now. But the biggest thing is I want to see that your rigging is appropriate, that your animation is very similar and that you've used some, you've used the motion capture um, in a very similar way to what I'm doing. I want to make sure and stress that I want the animation 
and the uh, motion of Eve to be this have the same properties. Okay, so if your robot looks different, it should still have the head that moves separate. It should have the arms that move separate. It should be floating and hovering into the scene and yada yada yada. I'm not gonna keep repeating, but that's what I'm looking for. Uh, yes, the template folder is a god. I am happy you enjoy that, Mel, because. It does. It saves you time. Literally just copy and paste, right? So I'm going to go and, well, let's see if we can, let me type hovering robot, right? Let me, hovering robot. Okay, we've got some interesting stuff here. Some things with some interesting arms. I'm just going to get like an idea of something. When you're looking for references uh, and the way we're going to create it inside of Cinema 4D, it's a good idea to get a reference that's more face on, something like this, versus something that's at like a three quarter turn like this, or something that's weirdly angled or oddly angled, right? So maybe something more like this would be cool. Um, like this, right? Like if you're going to design your own robot, don't design something like this that's just a sphere. Um, or like this, right? Or if it's a design similar to this, make sure that it's got the arms and the head that move separately. Like this would be okay. This would be per perfectly fine. This I would add a head in some sort of way. Um, this I would just not do unless this was the entire body of the robot and he was just like an obese little little tank of a guy, right? Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Because I want to be able to see that you guys are understanding hierarchies. And similar to the robot arm that we did in After Effects, there has to be parts that are connected to others. So with this guy, he's just like really one singular part. And that's not really going to count, right? Um, I think I'm going to stick to some like Eve style bot. Like this one wouldn't count. You want the head to be separate. It's very close to what we've done in the past, but... Uh, you want it to have like a separate head. Maybe this little guy's kind of cute. A single eye on here. We can do similar arms or something like that. Okay, I'm going to save this image as just kind of a reference, right? I'm going to hit desktop, go here, save it into my assets images file. Save that. Cool, saved it as a JPEG. Might do something like that. I like that singular eye look. I think that's pretty cute. <laughs> Let's think of this like your personal... Gosh, does anyone remember that movie that... I think it was DreamWorks pick, put out a year or so ago by the little robot guys. They were like your little robot friends. They looked like little eggs like this. Um, but they would follow you around everywhere. That was cute. I don't know. I'm just I'm just thinking of that. Like, think of this as like your little robot personal assistant. Or if you could have a robo pet, this would be your robo pet that cleans your room for you, right? Maybe does your does your animation homework for you. <laughs> All the fun stuff. Ron gone wrong. Dang, way to go, Angel. I am. My memory has been. Not so great to me in the past couple of years, and especially with names, titles, things like that. I'm always having to jujul things, and so um, I appreciate you guys when you're helping me. This little guy is kind of cute. Maybe we can save something, save image, something similar. Just little details that we might want to see on our little guy. Okay, cool. Um, I'll save this one just in case. Maybe I'll look back at him and be like, oh, I want this little detail on it or something. We'll make a mod podge of him. So I've got some references here. Um, the first thing that I want to do is I want to save my project file. So I'm going to go save project. And we are going to go to our folder and I'm going to save it here. And then I'm going to type in. Eve bot or I guess we'll just put hover bot right because this is more of a hover bot and I'm actually going to change the name of the file so that it matches that so since we changed the name right there I'm just going to come here 
go back, singular click. Hoverbot. There we go. Run the folders and open another program. Try again. Okay, I will change this later. But it's Hoverbot. We'll think of it that way. So are we using Eve or designing our own robot? You're going to use, you can use Eve. You can still create Eve in the same way that I did in the other ones too. Or you can do what I'm going to do right now. You can have a little bit more fun with it. But the whole thing, Angel, is that the animation is the same, right? So in that you're, you have, again, um, similar parts to your robot design that we create in class. So it has to have a separate head. And it has to have separate arms in some way or form, right? Like if we look at this one, like if we look at the robot for Eve, she is a head that moves independently from her body, but also is attached to her body, right? And then same with arms. She has arms that move independently of her body, but are also parented and attached to her body. So your robot must have a head, a hovering body of some sort, and arms. It can be... You can add to the design and do something a little bit more fun and have more fun with it. Or you can stick to the same Eve bot design that we have going on here. But just really the biggest thing is that the animation is like pretty much the same. So the robot's going to hover into the screen. It's going to hover and spot for a little bit, look around. Then it's going to see something and move off screen, right? So that's the biggest part of your design is that it needs to have a similar animation and separate parts of its body. Does that make more sense? All right. I think I already still have it. I didn't close it. Now, uh, hover but a saved. When incrementally saving, let's see if I have my zoom tool on. Zoom it. I think it's already on. No. There we go. There we go. Turn it on. All right, now, when you are up inside of the area here and you click on File and you go to Save As, there is the option to Save Incremental. And if I click on that, so if I go to File, Save Incremental, which is also Control-Alt-S as in Sam, um, what happens is all of a sudden up at the top, you see that my Hoverbot went from just a regular Hoverbot name to Hoverbot underscore 0001, which means it incrementally saved that as my first increment. So when I go into my EveBot folder and I look into my Cinema 4D files, all of a sudden I have an additional file here that is an incremental file. So like if I delete this and I go back to this, it might give me a warning here let's let's open that file we're gonna open the project we're gonna open this nothing will show up let's create this object here and we're gonna control s to save it and then we're going to incrementally save so now if i go back to my folder here i will have that hoverbot 001 and let's, we're working in that file right now because it's telling me that's where I am up there. Let's say I'm going to do some more stuff to it. I add in the scene, a capsule, just some more primitives to have fun. Maybe there's a figure here. We're just doing all sorts of crazy chaotic stuff. I save this, right? Let me close out my folder. If I open my initial Hoverbot, project it should be just a cube and it's going to open on the other screen for me which is okay but let me bring it over here and it is correct it is just a cube so I can go back in time 
to a different point where I was in my work and see it originally there versus if I open the Hoverbot 001 increment that I created, it is going to have the little guy I put in there, the additional capsule, capsule, all the extra geometry that I put in there. So you can see the power of incrementally saving your project can save you down the line when you're doing something and maybe you have a malfunction somewhere. I recommend you don't have to do this. Um, Every single time you save your project, right, you can do several hours worth of work and then do an incremental save. So maybe you do this um, once a day when you're done working. Maybe if you're good at your file saving and keeping up your files and stuff, you only have to incrementally save um, every revision round, right? But right now, what I want you guys to do is get used to incrementally saving your projects every time that you do a session in them, right? So you spend four or five hours in a project, save it, it's all saved, incrementally save, right? So the next time you go to open it, you're gonna wanna open the, the most recent increment and work from there, okay? Because if you open, so if I had done a bunch of work here, saved it, incrementally saved it, and then I've got all this work here. I start working in it. I do all the work. I'm going to incrementally save again. And then I would open the next incremental save and work from there the next day. Okay. Does that make sense to you guys? Just let me know in the chat if that is registering. <clears throat> And then if it is, we will move on. Hi, little Minerva. Got a little friend here with me. I'll delete this cube real quick. And while you guys are letting me know if you have any questions in the chat, I'm going to prepare my project, right? So I'm going to look at the project settings and make sure that they are appropriate. And 1920, 1080... 24 frames a second. I'm going to do that not only in my project settings, but then I'm also going to do that in my render settings just so they're all ready to go. So I'm going to hold control D to bring up my project settings here. <laughs> I'm going to shut off my camera so you guys can, so you guys don't have to be distracted by my lovely face and you guys can focus on the software. Alrighty, let me over here, right? So we're working in 24 FPS. And the next time we're gonna do, let's do 24 times 10. We're gonna do 10 seconds here. Um, it might be a little bit longer because based on the animation, but I think 10 seconds should be pretty good for what we're gonna be doing. And then I want to also make these setting changes here in my render settings. So I'm gonna come up here 1920 by 1080 and 24 frames a second and changes to all frames, right? So zero to 240. And then I'm just going to get my output ready to save alpha channel. Let's do, we're using this as a standard render. Let's see here. Save. Why is it not giving me? Am I working in? Oh, wait. I'm working in Cinema 4D Lite. That's no bueno. Um, let me resave this. Actually, let me delete this project. We want to be working in Cinema 4D, the student version. I was like, why is it not giving me the option to save? That is an issue. Exxon Cinema 4D 2024. Is this still pulling up late for me? Yes, it is. One second, you guys. Let me get this fixed. It'll just take a minute.
Okay, keep bearing with me, you guys. I don't know what's going on. Uh, where's my Maxon man? I updated my computer to um, Windows 11 a few weeks ago. I think before... I did it before... Where's my Maxon manager? There it is. Reopen this. Um, I opened... Or I updated it before... Spring break. So what does it to say? Sorry, my brain stopped. Still not all the way there. My brain is still catching up. After not feeling great. Oh... Sign the license. All right. I had to just letting you guys know. Um, I had a couple students drop the course, which is normal. That happens. Um, and their big question to me was if they want to sign back up for the course, will they be able to re-sign? Like, did they have to cancel their max on student thing? The answer was no. You'll be able to renew this again in a year if you guys need to. So, um, let me release this. Yes. And so, if you guys ever wonder if you'll be able to renew this license and use the student stuff next semester, when you're in your other classes, you absolutely will be able to. So, um me assign the appropriate license again there we go this should work now okay I'm not gonna update it just quite yet I'll do that after after class let me reopen it please open the student version that would be fantastic Sorry, guys. It does everything. This is my secondary screen that you see my mouse on right now. And so, here we go. Okay, perfect. Yay. Okay, now we've got the ball rolling. Let's bring that over here. Let's maximize this. We're going to save it. File. Save project. Cool, we're in this thing. We're going to save as hoverbot. Excellent. Let's check these project settings. 24. 24 times 10. Obviously 240. Let's go into our... Here we go. Okay, this makes me feel better. We're going to go into the physical renderer. Or our standard one. This time. 1920 by 1080 and 24 frames a second let's do all frames again we're gonna go to save I'm happy I checked that before I started working because that could have been a pain later on all right let's pick the file we want to save this to when we're ready to render I just like to do this ahead of time so that when I'm ready to render everything's ready to go Making sure I have alpha channel checked. And let's go back to the physical render for this one. Cool. 1920, 1080. Cool. 24 frames a second. Everything looks good. Close out of that. So if we decide to do it in a different render, we can. Alrighty. Let me... Now what we want to do is we want to bring in those concept images into our software so that we can use it as a reference essentially to build and to model our robot off of, right? So I'm going to go into my orthogonal views. And before you used to have to import it in a different way, but I think now with the last couple updates um, if I just go to where my images are 
I can actually just click and drag. I want to go to the, wait, which view do I want to be in? Front view here at the bottom. Right here is where I want to drag it. I think if I just click and drag here, perfect. It gives me, it just puts my image, reference image, right, into here directly. Now, the reference image looks cool, but it's also um, a little bit too big. So we have to um, update the size of that. Well, we want to, it's a, not necessarily too big, but it's a little bit too opaque. We kind of want to make it transparent so that we can see, um, we can see through it a little bit and kind of build on top of it without it being, uh, how do I want to say, like distracting, right? So, um, how do I change that? One second, let me look at my... I know there is a... The reference image. A shifty. I had to go through my things to just kind of find where you can update your reference image at. Okay, so I hit, um, I drag and drop the reference image into here. And then if you hit Shift V, let me write that onto the screen here for you guys. So Shift plus V allows you to adjust reference image, right? Let me. Right, so when you guys want to change the transparency of the image or maybe the size or anything like that, you can do that by hitting the Shift V, okay? And so what you wanna do is once you do hit Shift V under the viewport front, there is, looks like they made it change this a little bit. Um, you go under back. So under your attributes panel, you wanna go to back right there and it shows the image that I dra drag and dropped in here. And then you can change the offset if you want to. I obviously want this to be centered in my project, so I want this to be zero, zero. You don't wanna change the offset there, but you can change the size if you want to, right? Um, the aspect ratio of this image is exactly the same. It's a one by one aspect ratio, which means that the pixel size on each side, it's a square, right? So the pixel size on each side is the same. Um, you know, it's not that big of a deal because it's just a reference image here. Um, the biggest one that I want to use down here is the transparency. So I'm going to increase the transparency. I think 75% is pretty good here. Um, just so I can kind of see it a little bit of the detail here and then I can, um, modify it if I ever want to come back in here and increase or decrease the transparency so I can see a little bit more of it but I don't want it to be distracting just there is like a reference for me to look back and be like okay I want to do like this to it right um I'm going to save my just quick save my project right now and before we get into kind of the nitty gritty of of starting to model against this reference image let's kind of talk about um, the difference between primitives and editable objects, right? So everything, like I said, well, back to the rigging, um, same concept that we used with the robot arm as far as like the objects having a parent-child relationship. Um, instead of, like I said, the pick whip with a inside of After Effects, I'm going to add a cube into here, um, or like a drop down menu like you have in After Effects in Cinema 4D, you just drag one object to another object within the object panel right here, right? So if I created this cube primitive and I've got this sphere here and when I want to rotate this cube, I want the, like if I go like this and start rotating the cube, right, I want the sphere to be a child of the cube so I want this cube to control what this sphere does right and so like I said instead of a pick whip here what you have instead is a um, kind of like that layer ordering 
to the objects within your object panel here. And remember how I said that when the arrow, you see this little arrow kind of next to my mouse when I'm in the object panel and I click and I get ready to drag an object. If it is and if the arrow is pointing to the left, it is just meaning that you're dragging the um, layer or the object um, up and you're just changing the layer order. But if this, if I drag this sphere up and the arrow points down and I let go, what that does is that makes that sphere here, it obviously creates like a, a hierarchy that you see here in the actual attributes panel, right? So this is kind of under or in a folder of the cube and that is determining the parent-child relationship. So the one, the object that is um, the highest in your link here in your linked objects is the parent object, making the cube the parent and the sphere the child. So now if I go to, if I grab this cube here and I go to rotate it, it will bring that sphere along with it, right? So pretty neat stuff there. A lot more simple than creating the parent-child. I mean, it's not necessarily simpler. It's just um, a little bit different than doing it inside of After Effects. I, I like that After Effects has the Pick Whip tool. Um, it gives like a visualization to dragging from one layer to another. <clears throat> but I also, if you're a visual hierarchy person, like seeing... Um, like when you open a folder and it shows all your subfolders and stuff inside your, like when I go to open this and if I open this and it has more and it drops them down and I go in and it's got more and more stuff in there. Um, and in fact, I think Macs show hierarchy a little bit better in their file structure here. But if you're used to that kind of stuff, you know, this will be a little bit more pleasing to you. But either way it works, this is how you create a parent-child relationship inside of Cinema 4D. Let's say that I wanted to create a blank layer, like a null object, right, that can control both the sphere and the cube. I can create that null object. I can rename this to, let's name it like controller. I don't know why I would want to do this, but if I did want to do this, I could take this cube and make it a child of the controller. And so if I were to take the controller and grab it and move that, it would move both of them. Um, but then I still have the option to select this sphere and I could, let's say instead of, let's scale the sphere instead of rotating it because you can't really see the rotation of the sphere. But um, I still have individual control of the options of the sphere as well, right? So I guess the null is kind of a hard one to tell. Uh, if I were to, if I wanted to disconnect that parent-child link, I would just grab the object and drag it either above or making sure that that arrow points to the left. And once I do that, it disconnects that link, right? So if I wanted this to be, let's put a cone in here. And we're going to move the cone over here. And let's say that I wanted the cube to be a child of the cone. If I were to select the cone and move this, it's going to move because not only is the cone apparent to the cube, but it also is inherently apparent to the child as well. So it kind of, you know, like think of like little duckies following the mom, right? Whoever's at the top is the mom and all the little duckies in the row follow the mom, right? But they all have their own little personalities and stuff. But all in all, they do what mama says, the parent says, right? So think of the parenting like that. <clears throat> Basically, parent controls a child. Children have a little bit of independent motion, but ultimately follow mama duck. So when we go to looking at the, when we go back into this orthogonal view and we look at this um, robot, right? It's obviously made of some pretty simplistic shapes. We have a sphere here, um, probably another, maybe like a ring that we could use here and a couple other spheres, but essentially these are all circular shapes. Um, kind of like this half sphere, like almost if you cut the sphere in half, you have this half sphere sh shape, couple tubes. Um, if you were to like, uh, thinking of breaking this thing down into some basic shapes, right? 
Now, <clears throat> that's great, but we want to be able to have a little bit more control, right? So when we create a primitive inside, when we just select a simple shape inside of here, specifically like a cube, right? This cube only has six sides to it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, if I want to increase the amount, remember we talked about this a little bit, but if we want to increase the amount of edges or sides that we have on this cube, we come over here. And before we make this an editable object, we want to make sure that we adjust the primitive appropriately. So if I were to create more of like that base body shape of the robot here or like Eve, the Eve bot had a similar kind of shape like this to her body, you would really want to take, it would start with a cube here, but you would want to increase segments and be able to round it off and, and kind of move things around as you would want to. Well, because this only has six sides, it's a little bit limited in that. And so we want to increase the segments right here of the primitive before we make this object editable. And so I'm probably just going to go uh, three by three by three. And you're not seeing those segments right now. And I think it's because the display is just in garage shading. Um, when you want to see the segments, you want to hit garage shading with lines. And so you can either do that in display and doing this, or you can hit N as in Nancy, B as in Bradley, and it will um, show you the lines that I'm, the segments that I was creating. Because before it was one, 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 um, which means one side, one side, one polygon per side, right? Um, but we need to bend those polygons. And so that's why we're creating the segments, right? Because the, the general rule um, when it comes to 3D modeling is that a single polygon cannot be bent. So you have to create these segments or little subdivisions here in order to create a different shape out of it, right? So if I were to take this polygon and pull it off of the cube, and it was just kind of a flat square. I have no ability to bend that, right? Think of that as a really hard, rigid material that you can, you have no ability to bend at all, right? So it's almost like creating an arc out of paper. And in order to do that, you kind of have to create, in a, you have to fold the paper like in an accordion, right? To create that kind of arcing shape to it. It's a similar concept here, right? Um, it's kind of... A little bit disconnected but it works as far as an idea goes so I'm going to create three segments three by three by three on each side so that gives me three by three which is nine um, little cubes inside of this and if I want to be able to control each one of these little sides I have to make this object editable and in order to do that you have to select the object inside of your object panel and you have to hit C as in cat um, on your keyboard and automatically what happens is instead of a little cube object right there it changes into this little triangle with the tiny little vertices on each little corner of it. It still says cube but it gives you the option here to um, have maybe different textures on each side of it right so all of a sudden we have a little bit more control over our object and when the object becomes editable Whenever we add additional segments to this object, it allows us to select each one of these um, either edge here, right? Because if we're looking at this, we have edges right here. Here's an edge. Here's an edge. All these lines are considered edges, right? Um, if we were looking to select those edges, we would have to come up here at the top and this is like our object mo mode right here. This allows us to decide how we're grabbing our object. Right now we are highlighted in this mode which is object, it's called object mode. 
and that allows us to grab the entire object as a whole. If I wanted to grab each one of those edges, I would have to go into edge mode right here. Let me actually go back so you don't have a bunch of arrows. Edges would be edge mode right there. If I wanted to select a particular point, like maybe I wanted to grab that point and this point right here, or maybe this point directly right there, I would go into my point mode right there, okay? And then let's say I want to grab a specific face of a polygon, like maybe I wanna grab this entire face and this face and this face of these polygons, right? Because each one of these is a separate polygon. A polygon has four sides to it always. That's good geometry when you're modeling. If it has less than, if it has three sides, it's not good modeling, okay? So when you're looking at things, each polygon should have four sides to it and that's appropriate modeling. It takes a little while to get there where you're like comfortable and you're able to make it so your geometry it looks good. Right now you're not gonna have that issue because we're doing simple modeling, but when you get a little bit further into modeling inside of a 3D program, that's something that you will have to keep an eye on. Um, but when you need to select each face of the polygon, you can grab polygon mode, which is this one right here. Okay, this this object right there, this mode, is a, allows us to select a face and put a different material on each each one of those. I know we used that when we created the room object inside of our surreal in real like a real scene that we did when we created the room and I showed you guys that you could put on the floor the flooring material um, and then you could put on the walls a different material right it was the same object but we just selected different faces or polygons and added a material to them okay so let's go back let's escape out of here And let's go ahead. Let me kind of demonstrate to you guys what I mean by a single polygon cannot be bent because I think that's kind of a hard concept to grab unless you can see it. So if I were to grab my, let's move out of here. And we have two different cubes here, right? One of them has multiple sides and or multiple different segments to it. And the other one here has only six sides to it, right? If I were to grab a bend deformer and I were to um, put that bend deformer on, if I were to make it a child of the regular cube that I just created, this cube with the primitive, and let's move it over here, right? Because it needs to be on the appropriate spot. All right, that's cool. Here, there we go. And I increase the strength of this polygon or this bend deformer, you can see that it's not actually bending these polygons. It's just stretching this one, shortening the other, right? All this, all these lines around it, these orange lines are showing my bend deformer, which um, just deforms my object, right? So when I do that to the polygon, or the, I'm sorry, the primitive cube, where we only have one side, or one polygon per side, it doesn't bend these. It just kind of stretches them and shears them a little bit so that it, it's kind of doing what I want it to do, but it's not actually bending it. If I go this way, it doesn't matter which way I go, it's gonna do the same. So it's not really bending it. You can't bend those polygons. You're never gonna get like a rounded um, edge to it. Like you see this, these rounded edges on the deformer itself, you're never gonna see that. But if I were to take this um, bend deformer, let's delete this one off of there. Actually, let's keep that one on there so we can see the difference live. And I were to put one onto my cube with the um, additional segments on it, and I started to bend this one. Oh, let's see here, I gotta make this. When it comes to deformers, you have to make them children of your object, right? Or else it won't affect it. But if I start to bend this, you get more of this arced curve that's happening here. Um, and that's allowing, it, that's happening because I add in more geometry to the actual object, right? So we have additional faces on each side of the object versus a single face on a single side. But if I were to take this cube 
And because it's a primitive right now, I can still, I haven't made this initial cube an editable object. This one right here to the um, right side is already editable object. I can't change the amount of segments that are on it right now with in the same way. There is a way to make more segments, but at this moment, you can't just change it like this. But because this one is still primitive, I can do that, right? So if I wanted to make this smoother, I could just increase the segments. Oops, let's find the right one. This one right here. And all of a sudden, I have this really smooth looking curve to my object by just increasing the segments, right? Now, the more geometry that you increase on an object or create on a, a primitive or just in general creating inside of your scene, when it comes to animating that, it can take significantly more time depending on how you are animating that object. So uh, less is more when it comes to segmenting your primitives off. Okay, um, that's why I only did three by three because I can always adjust that and add a little bit more as I go. But when I have this m much um, geometry to an object, if I were to animate this, um, it can start to get kind of messy and a little bit too detailed here. And um, we just don't need that much geometry because there's something else that we can use to make this smooth. And that is specifically called a subdivide surface. And now the subdivide surface is this green object right here. Oops, didn't mean to turn caps locks on. And um, you notice that there's these little arrows off to the side which show that there's more in that, right? But if I click and hold, let go, the, you see the menu here. If you grab the subdivision surface and I bring this down to, let's say, my my editable cube here. Um, let's put that above the editable cube. Let's do this. Let's delete this one cube. It's no longer needed. Uh, we're going to show you how to make this one smooth with less geometry, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to grab this cube and I'm going to make it a child of the subdivision surface. Now, automatically, it smooths everything out on this object. And there appears to be more um, polygons, right? More geometry automatically added. Now, this is kind of a computer-generated way of smoothing that out and putting geometry. What it does is it subdivides, right? We talked about this when we talked about the dice each face by a certain amount of times. So if I were to take the cube out of there and we looked at it, it would take this face like this one right here, this polygon, and it will subdivide this polygon by, um, let's see here, if I grab the subdivision surface object and we look at it's gonna subdivide it by two by two, right? So uh, let's drop this back in here and make it a child of that. And so now that key, that polygon that was there has, I think, four by four, right? So four by four, this way, this way. Um, it's just going to subdivide the actual geometry that's existing there and smoothing it out. So it's like if you stuck a big piece of clay, like a clay cube onto, um, like a pottery wheel or something, right? And you just smooth it out. That's kind of like what you're doing here. There is a lathe, what's called a lathe object here as well, which kind of does the same thing. Um, loft objects, lathe objects, which do something similar, but you're going to get a lot of mileage out of the subdivision surface by itself. And um, you can increase the amount of subdivisions. Now there, you can increase it in your viewport or you can increase it in your render. I recommend keeping both numbers the same and not going too high, right? So maybe let's go down one. And if we look at that, it, it just gets a little bit chunkier. So we'd want to go a little bit more. So we go back to two. Um, you could do, let's see, three. Oh, three by three. Um, that's not bad. That's a little too smooth right now. We can, maybe can change that later. We can work with the two. I think we can work with the two. The two will look fine. Um, 
there's different ways, like different ways that the subdivision surface works. I don't know. I usually don't change this option. Um, definitely not that one. I would never, I don't think, I wouldn't use that. I would not know in what scenario I would want to use that either. Um, so just keeping this at the Cat Mall Clark and Gons, just keeping it at the default will work just fine. Okay, so really the only thing you need to worry about is maybe you increase or decrease the viewport subdivision or the subdivision render, but um, I would probably just keep it as is, right? So I'm just going to take this bend deformer and remove it from my object here. I'm actually going to delete that. Let's see here if I can just delete it by itself. And then we have like just a smooth off cube, right? So I actually did, it looked like I did a lot of work with that cube, but ultimately all I did is add a couple deformer. I added a deformer onto it to bend it. And then I added um, the subdivision surface onto smooth that and it made it look like I had some crazy kind of curved arced object when really I'm still, I still just have a cube. Right. So the power of using these um, can really get you a lot further than having to create a bunch of separate geometry here. And this is much faster at rendering than actually adding in like manual geometry into it. So always go with less actual geometry or divisions on here and then adding the subdivision surface will help to smooth that out and working within that will be a little bit easier and it'll render a lot faster for you. Um, so like if I wanted to, let's say that the cube, right, was inside of this subdivision surface and um, this cube, I wanted to start to model it into something and I want to select, the cool thing is, right, with this cube, that is no longer a primitive, it's an editable object, but with it being inside of the subdivision surface, I still have access to those separate um, polygons that I created on the actual cube itself. So if I bring this back out of here and you look here, I can click, hold down shift, and select a bunch of different, um, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Click here and holding down shift, I can select a bunch of different faces, right? Because I'm in my uh, polygon mode right here. And if I wanted to move those faces outwards, I could do that right? to change the geometry and the way it looks. I can do that like this and start to get some kind of weird blocky engine look to it. Um, but I can also do this with the subdivision surface turned on. So if I take that cube and make it a child of the subdivision surface, now we can see what it looks like smoothed out. And so I could, let's say, take this side and I can keep moving that out a little bit more. Let's say I wanted to only move one point that's within here, right? So um, again, you can, when you hover over a point, it will highlight like that. And when you have a selection inside of Cinema 4D, it turns from blue to orange, okay? So I've got that one. I'm gonna hold down shift and click multiple um, vertices, right? And so I can drag those around. And if I just kind of turn my um, camera view, I can kind of see more of what I'm doing just by grabbing those little points right here. And doing this, I'm like, you know, changing the look of the actual object itself. Now, with the vertices, right, you cannot scale vertices. Um, you, I think you can, let me try rotating it. I didn't think you could rotate it, but well, vertices you can't rotate. Vertices, when, you want, when you're in vertex mode of your object and you grab them like this, um, the only thing you can do is you can move it, right? So if I hit E and I start to move this around, that's the only thing I can really do with that. Um, edge mode, I think very similar. I think edges you are able to add in rotation. I know that you can move that back. I don't know. Let's hit R for rotation. You can rotate an edge. Um, just to let you guys know, you can definitely do that. Um, can you scale it? If I hit T, can I scale the edges? It looks like it will work. I don't know if that's the best, best way to work with modeling, scaling edges and stuff. You could try that. Uh, 
you can see that when I start to move my view around, things look a lot different from different angles, right? So making sure that you grab things, you know what you're grabbing, you know what you're doing is going to be important here. Right? And you're not just randomly grabbing like this, like I am in this example, and just moving things around for the heck of it. Um, if I take this one and I scale it that way, it's not going to scale. I'm not going to scale that way, but it will scale this way. Um, I don't know if I would do it that way. I might... Uh, instead select points and then move those points around versus scaling edges. I just don't think that's a smart way to model. Um, but the one thing you can do is you can scale, you can rotate, and you can move um, polygons, like faces of the actual thing. So if I've got, uh, and then if I move here over into polygon mode and I've got this polygon selected, maybe we select this one as well. And then I start to scale that. That's a little bit of a smarter way to, um, edit the object versus doing that with the edge or the points. I would, I would likely want to scale or rotate anything using faces. Um, and then you can more or less see, like, you select your polygon faces and then you can see it looks a little bit better. It's tidier. It's a smarter way of moving around the geometry within the object. Now, wait for it because as soon as I bring this outside of my subdivision surface, it looks crazy, right? So that's what my object looks like when it is... Um, just all hard surfaced and there are no subdivisions to it and then all of a sudden I drop it into I be I always have with the subdivision surface your object always has to be a child of the subdivision surface and so when I do that I get this crazy looking kind of um I don't know like some kind of smooth rock right smooth rock looking thing so <clears throat> Let me, let's delete this. Let's start from the beginning here. I am going to go to my view here. Frame default and jump back to my frame default. And we are going to start to build Eve. So let's go back into our view here. I'm actually going to make my front view a little bit bigger. I'm going to work in here for a little bit of time. I'm going to move back. When it comes to modeling, it's smart to work within your orthogonal views and go from one to the other back and forth, right? So you're going to really be working a lot of um, forward, backwards. Again, if you hit F1, you'll go into your perspective mode. F2 will bring you into top mode. And this is on your keyboard, right? F3 will bring you into right mode. And F4 will bring you into the front mode. So you can switch in between different modes just using shortcuts on your keyboard. Or what you can do is you can go up. Oh, I did not mean to do whatever I did. Um, you can go up here and hit this little box right there. And that will take you to the four views that you're looking at. But you do have to, again, in order to make each one bigger, you have to click that little box in, in each one of these separate boxes or separate views, right? So I'm going to be working on that one. Um, so let's create a cube. We're going to start off with a cube for our... Um, little guy here let me see i'm i'm just in the rotation i have the rotation tool up i want to go into the move tool here and um it's really hard to see but the actual cube is here you can see the squares here i'm actually going to hit again um i think it's shift v yes shift v under back and i am going to again drop the transparency of my reference here so that I can still see my geometry um, because it was a little bit hard to see that there. But I'm going to take this cube and I'm going to move it down here. And it looks like about the same, pretty much almost like the appropriate height. Maybe we want to make it a little bit longer this way. I'm going to um, grab my, select my cube here and we, let's go ahead and add some edges to it. I'm going to do segments two by two by two. Okay. Uh, actually three by three by three. 
There we go. Like I did before. And up here I'm going to hit C on my cube to create an editable object. And uh, let's put this into a subdivision surface. So we're going to create that. We're going to drop this into make the cube a child of the subdivision surface here. Perfect. And let's kind of start moving things around so that they're kind of in a similar shape as the little body here. We're going to start off with the body. Um, the first thing, let's see, what do I have in my notes? Loop select. <laughs> yeah, there's different ways to select the um, polygons or edges and stuff. I'm probably going to work in edge mode a lot. Um, but you noticed when I was moving around, I was having to click, hold down shift and click and grab these here. Well, that's great, but what if I needed to grab an entire loop that goes around my object, right? So if I look at um, where my selection is in my perspective view, I only have the front face of this object actually selected as far as the edges go, but I wanna select like an entire edge that goes around the object. And so in order to do that, it's called a loop select, right? And, and the shortcut to that is U, L. As in, so U as an umbrella, and then if you look down in this little line, let's see if I can zoom in on this, perfect. L here is loop select, right? Now loop select works in a couple different ways. You can hit UL and notice that it's highlighting loops around my object, right? So I can, if I move it to these edges over here, it's gonna select the large face, the large front face. If I wanted to grab the top front, the like, top face of the cube, the entire top face of the cube, I would grab the edge right here. But let's say I only wanted to grab um, this inner loop right here that goes around the object this way or this way. You can just click and drag or click and select and hold down shift and click and select like this. This is really important when you are working in these views right here, right? So when you're working in a singular view and you're looking at something and you want to make sure that you're grabbing not only the front, but also the sides and the backs edges of that object, you can make sure you're in loop select, again, UL, and you can select a separate loop like that. And then I can hit um, E on my keyboard to move and it will just move that loop up. A little bit right so it'll move those edges those loop select edges up that I have here now um, let's see here this is gonna help when creating Eve's body um, if I were to go back into like my perspective mode here it doesn't look like much has changed because it's still just this weird cube but uh, right there perfect we'll go back to the front view here. Um, let's say we wanted to make this a little bit bigger. If I hit T and I can expand this out a little bit, now it's starting to get kind of like this rounded view. I maybe want to hit go back to E. So you're going to be using E, like E to move, um, T to scale, R to rotate. Okay, you're not going to use a lot of rotations here. Um, mostly you use rotations of an entire object. You're not really going to rotate the separate like lines or anything like that. So I just kind of want to move this up a little bit um, to kind of move this up to where the head would maybe be. I want to scale this out a little bit more. I'm going to come here and I'm just going to scale the X value over to get it a little bit wider. Um, if I were going more with the Eve, I would hit UL again to loop select. And I would, we want to grab the loop that goes around the bottom. So I changed my view here. So maybe I would go to, let's see, F1, F2. This is the top. I don't want the top, the right. Let's go back into our perspective. I'm going to go underneath. And I want to grab this one right here. And maybe I want to hit T and just kind of scale this in all the way this way. Maybe I want to scale it in a little bit more this way to get that tapered look down at the bottom. If I go back into my front view here, 
we've kind of got like this nice tapered if I click off um, you can see the geometry of the subdivision surface right here and it's almost like um like a bowl shape or you know obviously it looks like a diamond here if I were to bring this out of the subdivision surface and we were to look in the front view we've got kind of like this diamond shape happening here um in fact there should not be these are what I mean by, well, this polygon actually still has four. It looks like this polygon only has three sides, like one, two, three. But there's actually four sides to this polygon right here. And I can tell because, look, the edges are separated right here and here. Um, so that's actually not terrible. It looks like a three-sided polygon, which you don't want. Um, but it's actually four, right? And we have four here. I'd probably, instead of doing that the way that I did it, um, I'm going to actually undo this a little bit more, and we're going to move back into this view, go back up here. I would maybe, what would I want to do differently about this? Maybe I want, instead of doing a, um, I'd want to grab all the faces of the bottom of it. So I would go not into object selection, but into my polygon selection, and I'd probably grab all of these here just by holding down shift grabbing all of these and then maybe scaling it down a little bit more this way. Oh, not that way. This way, maybe a little bit more that way. Let's look what this looks like in our side view here. Not bad. Let's go in a little bit more like this. Cool. Maybe I want to bring this down a bit, so I'm going to hit... Um, E on my keyboard for the move tool. Maybe I want it to be a little bit longer down this way. So I'll bring it down like that. Um, and now let's kind of, so we have like the front face of our robot body set, but I want to create it and make sure it's like that on the side and not like too plump on the side. I kind of want it to be, you know, like the proportions to be appropriate for the robot. So I'm going to go into all four views. And if I look at the side of my robot here all right so if i reset this let's reset this camera view to the frame default there this side is a little bit too squared off it's a little bit too thick um for what i want so i'm actually going to go into my right view here and i'm going to select i think you can if you uh let's see you for selection oh when i move my mouse it's gonna Make that go away. Path selection. Let's try that. UM. Um, nope. UL. Cool. But that's going to grab a loop that goes all the way around the body. I don't want, necessarily want that, so I'm just going to hit um, regular selection. You can choose... Also, if you don't know the shortcuts, the selection options are right up here too. So you can grab them. This is just a singular one. Here's the looping options for you. Um, I'm gonna grab all of this holding down shift. And I'm going to scale this inwards a little bit. So it's not so Oh, you know what we want to do? Actually, we do want it to be loop selection. So let me go out of here. UL, I'm going to hit loop select again and make sure I'm grabbing vertical loop selections, right? So I want it selected all these sides. And then I'm going to hit T. I'm going to kind of bring these in a little bit like this. You can see what it's changing on the top right here. Um, I want to, so he's kind of looking a little bit, he's like thinner there. Um, I think I want to take all of the polygons on the top and do something very similar to what I did on the base. I'm gonna scale it inwards so that it looks Grabbing those, T, and I'm just going to bring that in. Oh, I don't want to 
change the flare out here. So I want to create a little bit more geometry here. Let's do this. Let's jump into this mode again. Hit, uh, go into edge mode and hit UL. I'm going to select this edge right here. I'm going to hit E. I'm actually going to move this down a little bit. And I want to create a cut. So, let me see, close polygon hole, bevel it, extrude, bridge, weld, line cut, edge cut, cut the selected edges, loop path cut, okay? Um, so, if you hold down, again, when there's the extra little things there, you can select line cut, but that's not what we want to do. We want to cut a loop around the actual object here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this tool here. I think you can also select it by hitting K, um, K and L, which is K, which is, um, come on, keys, I don't know, K. I think there was also M. It allowed you to select M. If you hold down M, loop cut is L and you'll just hit L. So M, L, K, L, same thing. Um, you'll see this tiny little, oh, it doesn't show up when I zoom on there, but this little box with a line around it on your uh, mouse, right? And so when you take this and you run it along an edge, you'll see that it creates this line here. And when I click, it's going to add another um, like line around the entire object. So if I go back out of this view, notice that I have another edge that was created all the way around. So I'm adding geometry to my um, to my cube. If I were to drop this cube out, you notice now, instead of um, just three divisions like I had created in the first place, right? Because it should only add one, two, three, I added another one there, right? And so you notice that when I drag my mouse over these horizontal edges, it's going to want to create a vertical loop cut. But if I drag my um, mouse around one of the vertical edges of any of the polygons, it's going to want to create a horizontal loop cut. Okay, so that's how you get the difference between a vertical loop cut and a horizontal loop cut, okay? Horizontal loop cut, vertical loop cut, all right? Use those sparingly. We don't need to have a bunch of them in there. Um, I just wanted to create another one so that when I go, so I can have like kind of this wide shape to the top of the robot, but then also scale in part of the um, neck, you would think like the neck part of the robot, right? So I'm gonna bring this back into my subdivision surface. And I'm going to go back to my front view here, and I'm going to hit UL, and I'm going to grab that loop selection tool, and I'm going to select this new loop that I created, and I'm going to hit E on my keyboard because I want to bring that up, up here. I want a UL, I want to grab this other loop here, and I'm going to hit E on my keyboard, and I'm going to bring that one up because I want this kind of like strawberry shape to the body. And then I am going to go into my orthogonal view and I want to, let's move this around here. Um, I wanna grab just the top selection. I'm gonna hit UL and I just want this um, top loop right here selected. So you can do it on the under the top view or you can do it right here. And then I'm gonna hit T because I wanna scale that inwards. Bring that in a little bit. Let's see kind of how this looks on the top there, not terrible. I want to UL, I'm gonna grab, you can work in multiple views, which is nice. I'm gonna grab this one right here, and I'm gonna hit T on my keyboard, and I'm going to scale this in a little bit in both ways. <clears throat> so there's a couple different options here. When you hit, uh, when you hit scale, um, there's this little, so you get your normal, uh, obviously this one's why we can't see it because we're looking at the top from the top down on our object. But here is our Z axis and this one's our X axis, right? When I wanted to scale both my 
Z axis and my X axis at the same time, I would grab this little corner in between those two and it will scale those both equally on those two coordinates. It won't scale me in the Y um, coordinate, it will only scale in the Z and the X. I recommend not using that a lot in this view here, in the perspective view. If you're going to use that, use that in either like a top, front, or a right view, like a very flat, um, straightforward view because that can sometimes distort your geometry when you're in the perspective view in a way that you're not expecting until you move into a different, um, until you move into a different like view line or something of the object and you're like well how to get it like that that's not what I wanted and it's because you were grabbing this section right here and you know scaling it all sorts of weird so I'm probably going to scale it in like this way just kind of looking right here I mean like that's okay that it's not perfectly lining up with this um, this is more along the eyes, like lines of like what an Eve one would look like. The Eve one would have a more tapered base to it there. Um, I'm going to scale this back out just a little bit more there. Maybe I'm going to take this UL, go back into that loop cut and grab this one right here and hit E on my keyboard and maybe just bring this down in a little bit so it's a little bit more inset. Um, It's kind of got a, you know why? Because there's more geometry right here too. So I don't want to, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to grab the, I want to grab faces. Cool. I want to grab all of these faces here, 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 here. And then now with the position tool, I'm going to just move that down just a tiny bit. So we get kind of like this indented shape into our object. Um, if you wanna see what your object looks like without all these lines, right, you can go into display, just garage shading, um, or you can just hit um, N, N A or N B, right? N B will show you the lines of your geometry and N A will take those lines away. All right, so I'm gonna just N B, I like to see them. It looks a little bit more messy, but you'll get used to modeling in that view. All right, like the body's okay. I'm probably going to actually make the, let's go to loop select and I want to select edges and I want to grab this. I want to grab, I want to grab this edge and this back edge. I think I'm going to go this way. How do I get you? There you go. Hold down shift. Holding down shift. Oh, wrong one. Gosh darn it. This one. Grab it. Hold down shift. And it's just a little bit easier for me to grab these ones. Shift. Um, scale these a little bit in this way. All right, it's like a tiny little weird bowl thing. That'll work. And then let's create the head. Um, so the head is a sphere. I'm gonna throw a sphere in here. I'm going to, from my front view here, which is F4, I'm going to bring this upwards here maybe. Let's scale them up. So uh, I wanna scale this, this, First, we want to make this object editable, but before we do that, um, I'm going to go actually back into my perspective view here because it'll be easier to understand and see. So when you're looking at the way the geometry is wrapping around the sphere, it all comes to like this point right up here. And when it comes to um, modeling this sphere and moving around these different polygons, this becomes an issue 
right? And so we have to change the way the geometry wraps around this sphere in the first place. And so when you just create the sphere primitive, it automatically defaults to this like geometry here. And it's a standard type. When you come over down here, you see it's standard type, right? We want to change this from standard to hexahedron. And then what you notice is that it kind of wraps the geometry around almost like you would see on like some kind of ball, um, like a tennis ball or a soccer ball. Um, when you look at the stitching of how the material is sewn together around the ball, this is more of what you would see, right? Edges here um, where they would come to a point right here instead of at the top of it, like a baseball would be more like this. And um, this allows us to have those four-sided polygons. So when it comes to modeling and manipulating this geometry, um, after we create it as an editable object, this is going to be much easier versus having it in the standard, um, in the standard geometry of the sphere, which at the top is where you start to really come into that issue of I've only got one, two, three sided polygons up here. And when it comes to animating these, this becomes an issue. So before you create this as an editable object, let's put this in a hexahedron. Um, we could probably drop the segments down. Um, I think 16 should be fine. Half of what it was before. Um, we can create it a little bit bigger. Let's go back into that front facing view and increase maybe the radius of this so it's big, kind of like the guy that I have here. Um, drop that down a little bit. So that is how I want to increase the size of my circle rather than coming into my sphere, going to the coordinates and increasing the scale because then that changes that from a one to one to one scale. And we don't want to start off with that. We want to start, we, I mean, we don't want to start off with this, um, you know, not in the one to one to one ratio. If this were like, if we were to increase it like this and this and this, it's not terrible, but we're just starting off with these values. And I think that it's just easier to start off with a one, one, one value in your scale properties in case you do need to animate that later. And so I like to make sure that I'm my sphere is the size that I want it to inside of the object before you create it as an editable. When it's still a primitive, you just go into this object panel and you change the size with the radius here. So I'll increase that. Let's just do 160 because that's an even number. 16 segments, hexahedron, that's great. Let's now turn this into, um, we'll hit C. Now it is an editable object and I have control all over all of these little sections here, right, if I want to. Now this is a sphere and his head's a sphere, so that's fine. Maybe I want to make the, um, oops, I did not want to do that. Let's go back, reorient this like that. Oh, of course I would do that when I hit undo. I'm trying not to give you guys vertigo. I'm about to give myself vertigo by doing that. Um, all right, my sphere is now editable and I can grab these different sides. Um, I could do this. Let's see, let's go into a different view, maybe the top view. So what was that, F3? Um, that's the right view, top view here. <laughs> if I pull this back out and I'm looking at what this looks like, his body is so small compared to his head. So... Maybe we increase the size of his body. which I would do under the, grab the polygon object, and then we're just gonna increase this by one each size. So we're gonna double the size. No, that's too big. Maybe 1.2. There we go. 
looks a little bit better. I'm gonna grab his head. Dish fear. Hit E. Grab the entire object. I want to move the object, so I have to go back into object mode. Move that upwards. All right. And now let's go into, I think I'm going to grab the sides. Let's hit loop select UL. Come on. Let's loop select. Uh, actually, let's just grab the regular selection tool, which is this one. I'm trying to decide what I want to do with this guy because his head is kind of weird. Just as a sphere, uh, probably select all of these. If I just click and drag, I can select big patches of things. I think that's then this one all the way down to here. So when I want to select, cool. That looks appropriate when I'm looking at that. And then I also want to do that on the back side. So, and I did it all the way up to this one. So I'm gonna grab, hold down shift and move here and just select all these faces. Should be equal selections. Like if I look at the, this side from all different sides, um, they're lining up, right? The selection looks symmetrical. So, and if I move this way, cool, that looks great. Maybe I want to hit T and scale these in a little bit. Maybe not even the back side as much. Maybe the front side. Actually, let me just do the front selection of that. Yeah, let's do that instead. You can only grab them like that if you're in the perspective view. Apparently it doesn't work in the other ones. Like if I just click and drag, it's going to try and scale everything. Um, I have to just be in selection mode here. There we go. There we go. It allows me to do that. Cool. So maybe I want to um, move this in a little bit. All right, so it's a little bit more inset. What does that look like on this side? All right, kind of neat, right? So maybe his face looks like a little screen that's inset, which we can do later. We can add a different material into this later. Um, let's see, do I want to bring out maybe, uh, what do I want to do with this guy? Let's add um, some more geometry to him. I'll just inset the face right there and then we'll add like some more stuff into here. So let's see what it looks like in the subdivision surface. That's kind of neat. Cool. We'll just add that on there, in there too. Oh, wait, when we do, when you add multiple objects, they have to have their own subdivision surface. I think it won't, um, you can't, can you do it? If this is a child of the cube, it will. So the only way that the subdivision surface will work on both objects in here is if one of these objects is a child of the other one. So if I were, let me rename these, right? So this is the body. Let's get proper naming here. This is the head here. And as soon as I made, um, like if I come in here and I just drop the head as a child of the subdivision surface, the, um, the head is the only thing affected by the subdivision surface, but I also want the body to be affected by it. And so what I have to do is I actually have to make the head a child of the body. And then the body has to be a child of the subdivision surface in order for that to work out. Okay. So there has to be a hierarchy 
um, to we have to do parenting, a little bit of parenting to the head and the body in order for them to be up like with that subdivision surface. You guys can work outside of the subdivision for surface at first and then put it in there if you want to. It's up to you guys, you know, whatever's easiest for you to look at. Um, I'm actually going to move, grab the object mode right here, and I want to move the head down a little bit so it's closer to the body. Not quite touching, but just a little bit closer. Uh, maybe right there. Uh, I don't mind that the head's a little bit bigger. Let's add some like eye thing to it. So I'm going to do that by using a torus here. And the torus is like a donut shape, right? So when you first see a bunch of, um, let's go into this view here. When you see a bunch of things online and they're like, let's model something for the first time, they always make a torus. This is exactly what it is. Um, I'm going to grab this and I'm going to put this as like, um, I one because I might add more to the eye and I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees. So let's see which way that's, yep, that's going to be perfect there. 90 and let's move this forward. And we obviously, I want this to be the radius from the inside of this to be smaller because I want it to be like a smaller, thinner ring. Um, and so you have to do this while you're in a primitive and not in an editable object mode. And so what I want to do is I want to go to the, is it the ring radius? That's the whole entire thing. Uh, the segments we can drop down a little bit. 10 will be fine. The pipe radius is what we want to change on here. I might increase the ring radius or the ring segments a little bit to 16. Let's do that. And then let's change the segments. Okay, that segment part. So the segments, the pipe segments are around the entire thing, like adding more of these lines this way. And then the ring segments will add more around to the ring, right? So look, you can get like this triangle shape, square shape, um, you know, just more like unique shapes or something, just using this torus. Um, so great ways to use these primitives and updating these, excuse me, sorry, <coughs> these object properties in order to create like, you know, just basic shapes. Everything's built out of a basic shape. When you look at everything, you'd be like, how could I build that out of just basic shapes, right? So thinking of that, that's how you wanna think when you start modeling things. Um, I'm gonna bring this down here. I obviously don't need it to be that big, so I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller, probably like 50. Uh, actually, a little bigger than that if I bring this into this view and I want it to kind of fit within this thing probably gonna do it at 70 that looks good and then the pipe radius was that it Let's thin that out a little bit to 10 10 and then the segments here we can just do 10 okay it doesn't have to be anything crazy and then I'm just gonna push this in here so it's showing using these different views I'm just gonna kind of set this back I'm gonna rotate it a little bit because of where it is let's bring it up a little bit more kind of more centered on the if I zoom out a little bit here move this up in my view I want it kind of more centered yeah, I don't even have to rotate it because I have it right there. Cool. Now let's kind of, if we look at the, if I hit Shift V and I bring up the, in, you have to select whatever, you know, I dragged my reference image into this front view here. So in order to update that image, that reference image, you have to be in that view in order to make changes to it, right? So I'm going to decrease this so I can see it a little bit. More, I'm gonna shut these off so I'm not looking at them. And I'm gonna see, like, there's like kind of like a camera lens thing looking happening going on. So maybe I'm gonna duplicate. Let's add the Taurus back in here. I'm gonna create that, I'm gonna make that a child of the head. Um, and it looks solid black here because all of a sudden there's a ton more geometry around it. 
Uh, but if I were to zoom in on it, it would just be a ton of little tiny polygons, right? So you can see that right there um, that are just affected by the subdivision surface, right? So maybe we duplicate this. Uh, let's go to this one and duplicate it again, or sorry, Control-C, Control-V. And I'm going to bring that down and also have this a child of the head. And let's change, let's change the name of this to I to let's put an underscore to separate these so we know what they are so it's a oh there we go we want to make this one a little bit smaller so we're going to change the ring radius maybe not that one let's just use scaling on this because we're probably not going to animate that so t uh, wah, 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 wah. We want to scale it this way. Ooh, I know what's happening because of where it is. So let's move it out of the object first so we can see what it looks like. And then let's try updating the ring radius here. Not bad. All right. It's really, really tiny, tiny right there. Um, undo that let's move this out of the subdivision service so we can see it okay oh cool so you can grab these little um, if you notice there's these little yellow things because it's still a primitive object you can grab these and scale it down using this right and it's not going to change the scale of the actual um, object in your coordinates panel right there. It's just going to change it here. And hey, you, none of that. I got a little guy picky pawing at my chair. None of that, little man. None of that. None of that. It's cutie patootie, but he's off on a little stink. All right, and then I'm going to move this back into here. Maybe right to there. Um, let's drop this into the subdivision surface, see what that looks like. Cool. Uh, right there. And then maybe we add another sphere. And that's the actual, I don't know, the eye. Uh, move this forward. Move it up. All right, kind of centered there. Let's grab this right here and make it small until it fits right in there. And then we can move it backwards so it kind of sticks out there. And if I just zoom in to my image in the front and we, let's, again, we're in the front view here. I'm going to hit Shift V and then increase the transparency right here so I don't have to see it. And I grab that sphere. And just kind of making sure it's like in the center of that torus right there. So when we look at it, I've got like this singular eyeball kind of thing happening on my object here. So it's like a robot with the eyeball. Let's create. So I'm going to say this one's the eyeball, I guess and make that a child here to the actual um but i actually haven't made this an editable object yet so i can actually change the segments down to 16 so they're not so many um change this back to a hexahedron um maybe drop the radius down to 35 so it's you know even number i can zoom in here um okay maybe we want it a little bit higher there maybe 40. there we go cool 40 looks cool that looks great and then we're going to let's add like a little head thing on it maybe he's got a little antenna um so you can add an antenna to it so i'm just gonna bring this back out here move over here i'm um, actually before we do the antenna part Let's maybe 
create the arms because the arms can be a thing. Um, and I'm going to create them kind of like the Eve, um, like the Eve bot more than this, this type of arm here. And the reason is because it can be a pain to get the uh, orientation of the arms appropriate. So let's kind of make this one a little bit bigger here. Um, let's zoom out, move up. And I'm actually going to remove, I'm going to hit Shift V and remove this image. I'm just going to hit not show picture, right? So now I don't have that picture in my view. I don't have to worry about it. I've just kind of got this, um, just my geometry here. I no longer have the reference image, right? And I can always change that by just clicking show on. Um, but you know, that's just a way to turn it on and off a little bit easier there. I'm going to save my project right now, just a regular save. After I'm done with everything, I'm actually going to do an increment incremental save. Okay. So when it comes to the arm, uh, let me see. We're going to start with a cube. And we're going to, so let's create a cube. We're going to just name this arm underscore one. And we're going to, let's do three by three by three as far as segments go. And we're actually going to make this skinny, 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 skinny right away. Move this into kind of an appropriate spot. Maybe right here his little arm would be, right, by his body. And um, let's go into this top view here, right, because the arm is now thinner, but we need to make it less wide. It doesn't need to be as deep. And so I'm just going to come here and make that a little bit smaller. In fact, I think that maybe two on the top. Um, how many segments do I want it to have? Let's see here. If I zoom out. I think it only needs to have, I think the three by th two by three by three looks good because I don't really need a ton of segments on the one side. I think that's good here. And we're going to now make this an editable object. So I'm going to hit C and we're going to go into, let's see here. Let's grab the loop select UL and we're going to go into our edge mode and we're going to select the top loop right here and I'm going to hit T on my keyboard and I'm going to make this a little bit smaller both ways. We're going to kind of scale this down a little bit and I'm going to do the same UL with the bottom loop here so maybe I have to move this around here and I want to grab this bottom loop like that and then I'm going to hit T and I am also going to scale this down in like this. Maybe it's quite a bit smaller there. Um, let me see here. What do I want to do now? I don't necessarily need the, I want it to be kind of thick in the middle, but not so much on the edges. So I'm also going to hit UL to grab another loop select. I'm going to grab this loop right here. I'm going to rotate around and I'm going to hit shift. And I'm going to grab this loop right here and then I hit T on my keyboard and I'm only going to scale in the X, the X value here. Let's see. Maybe we want to, I'm going to hit U L and I'm going to grab this loop select right here and I'm going to hit T and I'm going to move this or I'm going to hit E. I'm actually going to move this up a little bit to kind of create that there. Maybe this one too, UL, hit T or E, sorry to move tool, move this maybe up a little bit. Maybe I want an extra loop cut there. So KL, again, loop cut, and I'll add another one in right here. Maybe I'll add another one in right here. And um, UL for loop select. And I'm going to grab this one 
select E, and I'm gonna move that maybe down a little bit. Hey, stop chewing on things, little guy. Oh my goodness, I love you, you little terror. You're a little terror, and I love you so much. But you're a little stink. All right, so I think the arm is okay. Let me, I'm actually gonna make it smaller, I think, at the top. I wanna add, I wanna take this loop, move it up a little bit higher. Like that. I'm gonna take this one, move it up. It's just a lot of like, it's just a lot of back and forth, right? Like, what looks good? What doesn't look good? I'm trying to decide, do you like it? Do you not like it? Right, moving this up a little bit. A little bit more. Um, maybe I wanna take the inside panel of everything um, and I want to bring it in so we get like some kind of, maybe I wanna get some kind of bend to be happening in to this. Um, a couple things, I mean, I guess maybe we could try it with the bend deformer. Let's try that. Let's, oh, not sheer, undo. Let's add a, oh, where'd my arm go? Z, 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 okay, there we go. Bend deformer, let's make that a child of the arm. Let's move that bend deformer over to the arm right here. Uh, we want it to go down. We're gonna have to change the, I think we're gonna have to change the shape of the bend deformer. So maybe it's not so wide right there. Let's increase that. Let's, ooh, it's not bad. Uh, not the angle. Maybe we want to change the, maybe instead of that, it's the negative Y. No, I want it to bend like this, but I want it to bend from a different point because right now it's bending from like the base and I kind of want it to bend from the center. Um, if I hit fit to parent, it's going to bend from wherever my my um, anchor point is on that arm. So let me go ahead and hit, let's reset this. Let's go back to the positive Y. Let's go to zero. So we have no bend happening. Um, let's see here. Where is, if I grab my arm, the anchor point is actually in the center. Let's maybe move the anchor point for a second. Let's in order to move the anchor point of the object, right? So the anchor point is in the middle of this cube that I had created. And um, when you're moving, like when we created the robot arm and you think about any kind of arm, it's gonna move from like a shoulder joint, right? A shoulder socket joint, maybe up here. And so um, what I would wanna do is I would wanna actually move this anchor point to this area here. Now, in order to move an anchor point on an object inside a Cinema 4D, you have to select the anchor point, um, the enable access tool. Oops, not that one up here, which is this tool right here. You want to make sure that you select that and you create, you put your anchor point where you want it to be and then you get out of that mode. Because if you stay in that mode and then you start trying to move things around, you're going to end up just moving the axis around and you're going to get really confused on why your object isn't moving and just your um, your axis or your point is moving, right? And so when I select this, this is great. I'm going to move this up in this view right here, right to about here. But if I try and start to move my object, if I go into object mode and I start to move my object all around, I'm like, why isn't it moving? Well, that's because I'm still in anchor point mode right here. So I'm gonna hit Z. Um, I'm gonna hit Z again. Let's see here. If we're in the object mode, can I move the anchor point up? That's fine. I'm going to select off of anchor point mode. And now if I move the arm, it will move and it will move from that spot. So that's perfect. Now if I select this bend deformer, where will it start to bend? Okay, it still bends from the bottom. Can I adjust this? Maybe if I actually move the bend deformer up, will it work that way? Oh, oh wow, you can actually grab it inside of the actual, um, that's kind of neat. You can grab it like this inside of the, 
inside of your thing can do that. That's interesting. Never done it that way. I've always, it's easier just to use the values here. So, um, angle zero, um, actually that's not bad looking. Let's see here. Let's move this over. Let's try it without the bend modifier on it. I think it'll be easier the other way. This is just gonna be more confusing for you. So I'm just gonna delete that bend modifier. I'm gonna grab the arm. Um, we're gonna go into this mode. Our anchor point is still set. I'm actually going to um, hit UL and go into edge mode here. And here's a way we can get a bend, right? So if I grab, if I'm in UL loop select, and I grab this loop right around here, and then I just hit my move tool and I push this out. We're going to get a little bit of a bend. And I'm going to have to do it UL to this one right here. And hit E and get a little bit of a bend until I move it. All right, right there. UL, I'm going to grab this one here, up here. Maybe you don't want as drastic of a bend, but... That's just the way mine's turning out right now. We'll move it right there. I'm going to grab UL, loop select, grab this one down here, if I can get it. I might make this one a little bit less. A little kind of far out there. And I want to grab this loop at the bottom here, so maybe I have to just kind of go like this just have to work it to the different perspectives grab that little loop here hit e on my keyboard bring that in a little bit so i've got like kind of this curve happening and then i can drop this into i'm going to make it a child of the body and it's going to add that into my subdivision surface so now i have like a rounded arm right cool and then when i select that arm the anchor point when I go into the object mode is up at the top here. So if I rotate it, it will rotate from the top of the arm, right? Okay. Same with the head, right? We want to change the anchor point of the head so that the um, it's at the base. Like we don't want the head to be moving from the center. Um, we want it to be moving where it would be at the neck, right? So let's change the anchor point before we create the second arm because we're we're at 810 right now. We're going to um, add the second arm here in a second. But before I want to do that, let's get our anchor points correct with our rigging. Everything is attached to each other. But right now, the um, only thing that's not correct on them is the actual um, the anchor points on each of them, right? So I'm going to select the body. And I'm just gonna move into my move tool here and I'm gonna select my um, anchor point tool. I'm gonna move this up because the body is gonna move, like when you think of a body movement for this robot and how this robot would move, it probably moved from the center of its chest forward, right? That's what's gonna drive most of the movement. It's not gonna really move from like the belly button area or like, cause there is no pelvis, right? Like when you think of a person walking, um, the first part of your body that moves forward is like your pelvis and your legs and stuff like that. But because we don't have that here, we are being driven by like the body itself. It's, it's going to be up more close to the center of the chest is where the movement's going to come from. And that's where I'm going to move that anchor point for there. And then I'm going to click off of the anchor point tool right here. And I'm going to select the head, right? So the head has like the eyeball in it, the eye, all that kind of stuff, the eye rings and all that. Um, but if I just grab the head and then I go back into that anchor point mode, I'm going to bring that down here. I'm actually going to bring it below the actual object itself, right? So it's not even on the head or the face of my object. It's actually below where you would think like the neck would be, right? So when I'm looking over in this right view here, um, it's a little bit lower than the actual, like more based on the center of the um, body right there. So now, if I come out of this anchor point mode, make sure you're out of that, and I hit R for rotation, and I wanna move the head forward or backwards, right? It's moving from the appropriate spot. It's going all crazy, right? I might move the head up a little bit, um, just holding E, 
just bring that up a little bit so that when I go to rotate it, I can have a little bit more area that way, but it'll move that way just fine. So perfect. Um, now, as far as the other arm goes, let's um, create a copy of this one. So this is arm one. Um, I want to, let's hit E on our keyboard to grab the move tool and um, make sure that you are in your object mode here. And if I hold down control and I click and I drag, I'm gonna create an exact copy. And I'm gonna use, just move this right over here. And um, let's, uh, the, let's rename this to just arm two. It does 1.1, but I'll just put arm two. Bring that up here to be a child of the body, but not a child of the other arm, right? Um, let me see here. Just looking into my... Uh, hey, get out of there. I'm just looking at my notes here real quick. I want to make sure that I do this appropriately. Why? The segments. Okay, mirroring the arm. Object mode, shift C. Oh, there's actually a different way to do it, and I have this in my notes um, an updated way to do that. Get out of there. Ugh, cats and boxes. If it if I fits, I sits, right? That's the rule. There you go, Bob. There you go, bud. There you go. Sorry about that, you guys. So in order, we can actually mirror this um, instead of duplicating it like that. So, you you know, duplicating it like that, whatever. But in order to mirror it, um, you can hold down Shift-C and we can search mirror. And you want to grab the mirror tool, not for hair, but for other. Um, and you want to make sure the mirror is set to world mode. Let's see here. So under direction, you want it under world mode, okay? Um, so that it distributes the, like the arm on the actual other side of the body and not on um, like, <laughs> or else it'll distribute it in a really weird way. And so you want to make sure that this is absolutely on um, world mode and then you want this to be the X Y Z coordinate that's perfect and then you actually want it to be the plus slash minus and then I think if we just click and we click this and we drag it come on how does it work click the mirror I think we have to click mirror on it right so Selecting that, let's hold it, let's try it again. Shift C, grabbing that. Okay. World mode, X, Y, Z, this. Um, that's fine. Click mirror. There we go. Perfect. Ha <laughs> ha. That worked. Arm one. Now, if we hit rotate, um, cool. We get the rotation appropriate there. And then we can grab this one and have the rotation here too. Woohoo! Cool. <clears throat> so that's a really quick way to mirror the arm. The nice thing about it is um, it automatically like splits the arm from the other arm layer and creates it as like a separate separate object instead of like having them attached to each other. Um, so that's a really neat uh, part of having like the uh, using the mirror tool there but you have to make sure that you actually select mirror making sure that you're in world mode right so cool we have that done let's change the let's go back put zero on the rotation here so we're at like a default setting zero here um everything is kind of set with the body that's great i'm going to save this um i actually want the I actually want to change. Oh, let's do this first. Let's delete this section and let's change the 
Um, I'm going to select the arm. And I'm actually going to go back into the anchor point mode and hit E. And I actually kind of want it to start from like in between the center there. I think that will be good. Cool. Now let's redo this. So Shift C, mirror. Cool. It pops up automatically. Double click that. World X, Y, Z. X or plus slash minus is the one you want to make sure you have. Click mirror. And then we have the second arm. So I'm just going to put arm two. Right. Rename that. Cool. Save, save, save. Let's make sure that the anchor point is in the appropriate place. If I hit E. Cool. Perfect. Hey, little dude. Get out of here. Alrighty. Uh, this is all in the subdivision surface. Looks really nice. There is. Oh, I'm just looking through my notes to make sure I got everything for you guys. Actually, um, we need to change the orientation of the x-axis. That's why I forgot. Okay, so the axis or the anchor points of the arms, the orientation, we need the z-axis to be pointing down, actually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable the axis again, and I am going to go on to rotation, and I am going to um, grab this and holding down shift... I think moving forward up negative 90 degrees. If I hold E, does that work? Yes, perfect. So um, when you're all set like this and your, um, your arms are in the appropriate spot, your anchor point is moved up in between kind of like the shoulder and the body here, um, you're going to want to go back into the anchor point mold and you're going to hit R for rotation. And if the, um, the, what will happen is the Z axis will be pay, facing back in your top mode and you're going to, uh, sorry about that, but the, the Z axis is going to be pointing kind of north in your top view. And what you want to do is you want to grab the rotation point here and you want to move up holding down shift until you get to negative 90 on the value. And then what it will do is you go to E, you point E, and you'll see that now the um, Z orientation of the anchor point is pointing down, right? So now if we go to grab the, if we shut off anchor point mode and we're in the object mode here, and we go to hit rotation, I think that it'll rotate it appropriately when we go to rotate it like this. That's the biggest thing, is when we go to rotate it around like this, it's gonna rotate appropriately because now the axis is orienting the, or the anchor point is oriented the appropriate way, versus like if the anchor point was still pointing up, it wouldn't rotate appropriately when we go to do that during animation. So I am going to, come over here and I'm going to hit zero on the, not on the position, but I'm sorry, on the, oops, let's undo that, um, here on the rotation. We're going to type in zero. Perfect. Um, so we're, actually, it's at negative 90, I think, right? There we go. It's going to be at negative 90 on here, too. Um, just because of changing the orientation of the anchor point will change this number right here. So I wonder actually if you can just select that and change the anchor point that way. I don't think it works like that. Um, let's just unclick on that. We'll put negative 90 in here. Let me just double check that I didn't mess anything up when I go into your point mode. No, we are good. Okay. So, yes, making sure that the orientation of your anchor point on your arms is what you do last for these arms when you're done building them. Now, we want to be able to um, go back to this point, right? Because we have this little guy all set up here, um, 
in a very neutral position, right? But let's say we like moved him all around and he got all messed up and we're like, oh no, that's not what I want to do. I want him back into the neutral position because now he's all wonky and crazy. Well, there's a way to kind of freeze the coordinates into place on this guy so that um, if we get all out of whack, we can go back to this point, right? And so you have to select everything inside of the object panel here. And under the go to the coordinates and you want to select under the freeze transformation, freeze all, right? And so now um, th this what this allows is the position to be in the default position for your bot. So if you mess up a bunch of stuff, like I said later on down the road, um, all you have to do is hit alt zero and it gets back to the default position position that your robot is in but this only works if you actually actually freeze transform the position so like let's say then I take her um, or I take the entire bot right so I'm going to change this subdivision surface to hover bot just so I have like a appropriate naming convention here and like I rotate it and let's say it's all rotated weird and the head is all rotated weird like this and the arms are all out of whack let's say the arms are all like this everything's crazy right everything's not everything's topsy-turvy upside down nothing's the way I want it to be if I just hit alt zero uh, whoop, let me go here first let me go undo 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 it didn't work let's try and figure it out um, maybe it's under the body freeze if we select the body the hover bot and you freeze all right okay should work like this alt zero cool yeah it brings them to the beginning so let's try that again um so I did it under the subdivision surface here, so the entire robot, right? So let's do this. Let's see if we have to do it with the individual objects. Um, the body, let's rotate that out of whack. The arms, all crazy. We'll just do one arm. And let's try the head, just so we can see that if we hit Alt-0, it only does the most recent one. So maybe we have to freeze everything separately. Okay, freeze all. Let's go to the body. Freeze all. Arm, freeze all. Arm, freeze all. Head, freeze all. Okay, let's try this now. Let's see if that will work. All crazy messed up. Let's pretend this is just all crazy messed up, right? There we go. Let's hit Alt Zero, see if it works. Hmm, it only works. Oh, maybe you just have to be selected over the whole entire thing. Alt zero. No. Well, there we go. Where'd that arm go? I'm just hitting Control Z to go back. Okay, let's see here. Unfreeze all. Let's just select the overall, freeze all, move everything. Let's just try the head, let's see if it works. All right, if I select the hover bot and I hit Alt, zero. Puts the body back where it needs to be. I think we changed it. Alt, zero puts the head back where it needs to be. All right, so try that. Just, um, you know, make sure that you freeze. Go over your subdivision surface and hit freeze all. Um, so your over 
arcing, like the main um, parent, right, should be your subdivision surface. The body should be next. The arms should be connected to the body and the head should be connected to the body, right? Um, make sure that you select that subdivision surface and then hit freeze all. And um, I think what you'll have to do is then you have to just kind of go in separately in case it does get all crazy and you have to select on each individual object and just hit alt zero but it still freezes it all into the same selection but what i would do at this point right so i would save this and now what i would do is go into file and i would save incrementally so that when we come to work on this now on thursday's class and we throw some materials on this and then we start to animate this um, Hoverbot that we have here that we're starting we can always come back to this original kind of model that has no materials on it has nothing crazy it's just back to its basics um, so that if we like get out of control and it gets all kind of messed up we can go back to a point where everything was uh, more organized and static right so making sure that you incrementally save another thing is making sure like some big points here when you're modeling um, working within these orthogonal views like all four views are going to help hitting f1 puts you into perspective f2 will put you into top view f3 will put you into the right view and f4 will put you into the front view so you can go back and forth um, making sure that your uh, parenting is appropriate here and that when you go into your anchor point and you go to change your anchor points that your um when you're done with that, that you make sure you click off of your anchor point tool, right? Um, really not doing high segments when you're working on your primitives, doing lower segments and then letting the subdivision surface add that additional geometry for you. That's also going to be a big one, especially when it comes to the rendering, right? So we don't want to have a, this geometry is kind of just like, um, it's just, uh, what do I want to say here? It's like, not really there, but it is there. So it's just like showing that smoothing that's happening, but it's not really adding. This is not all separate geometry, right? Like when we were moving that around, it still only had a certain amount of points to it. And then, uh, you know, you can always update that subdivision surface if you want it a little bit more rigid or extra. Um, smooth, but remembering that the higher the subdivision surface amount, that it also is going to tax your rendering later on. Um, the other thing is when you're going to create the arms, mirror the, uh, make sure that your anchor point is in the appropriate spot at first. Then you can orient the anchor point and then you can mirror the arm, right? Um, I think that would be the smartest way to do that. I did it a little bit backwards there. I created the arm, I moved the anchor point, I mirrored the arm and then um, oriented both of them. I would probably do the orientation first so that when I mirrored it, the other arm is going to automatically be oriented in the proper, um, in the appropriate direction. And then making sure that at the end you select that subdivision surface and you freeze um, transformation properties, freeze all right there under the coordinates of that subdivision surface so that uh, it, you know, you can go back to that if needed, if it gets kind of all whacked out and under control. But this is really the modeling part of, of your hoverbot, right? So making sure that it's a hoverbot. It can be a little bit more of your own design. It doesn't have to look exactly like Eve. You can follow the tutorial that I've done in the previous class um, to make it look more like Eve if you want to. Um, you know, very similar to what we did today, just a little bit. The head's mostly different, right? Um, but on Thursday's class, what we're going to do is we are going to add some materials to her and then we are going to animate, right? And we're going to build out an entire scene here. And I'm going to show you guys how to animate using this motion capture tool inside of Cinema 4D, which makes it a lot faster and a lot easier. And it's a great way, like I said at the beginning of class, to get more complex animations and kind of block them out at first and then fine tune them afterwards. So, class is over for today. Do you guys have any questions in the chat? <coughs> before I before I log off incremental saving also increment
close this out of the way. Yes, I would love to save my project. Thank you. All right, if there are no questions, then I am going to let you guys go for the evening. Night, Jose. I hope you have a good Wednesday. Let me know if you guys have any more questions, um, you know, regarding any of the modeling. If you guys come into any issues, I suggest you start the modeling sooner rather than later. Um, that way, if you do have any issues, you can just ask me later. But all right, you guys have a good night, and I will talk to you guys on Thursday's class. Bye.